Hello everybody, welcome back to the second day of the festival. I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, to you John Vickers. He <laughs> needs no introduction, <laughs> but uh, let me summarize in a very few uh, words uh, who John Vickers is. He's a professor of economics at the University of Oxford and the Warden of All Souls College. Uh, previously, he was a Drummond Professor of Political Economy at Oxford, Chief Economist at the Bank of England, and a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. He was, as you know, the head of the Office of Fair Trading and chair of the UK's Independent Commission on Banking. He is well known not only for his uh, uh, public life uh, uh, roles, but also for his extensive research and results in uh, I.O. Okay, John is going to give us uh, a keynote speech on how having an imperfect demand side of a market, having consumers that have a perfect knowledge about uh, the offers that are available or that do not really understand the consequences of the many uh, different options can affect the outcome of a market and above all the desirability of uh, uh, policy intervention among uh, which the antitrust enforcement. And I think this is a very interesting topic. Uh, for us Italians, for some, for the Italians in the room, I think it's also interesting because there is a, a debate uh, currently on um, on the liberalization process, process in the energy uh, market. As you all know, the protected market should be closed, and so that all consumers are moved to the to the to the open free market. Uh, but the government keep postponing this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this move and uh, uh, we don't know this is whether this is uh, good or bad uh, for, for consumers. So that topic, the topic that John is going to talk about is very interesting also to address this issue. Okay, thank you. Enjoy the, the, the speech. John, the floor is yours. I'm going to stay seated because the audio will work better now that it is switched on um, by, by Paolo. So, Paolo, thank you very much indeed for the uh, invitation. Um, I've for many years followed the doings of Leo uh, with uh, interest and admiration. It's very nice to be here and in a cinema. I've never before spoken um, in a cinema, so that's one for uh, uh, an achievement I can chalk up uh, today. And thank you very much to everyone for coming. Now, my... Um, my topic has already been introduced uh, by Paolo, and I, I've called this competition for imperfect consumers because uh, in the economics of industrial organization, the economics which underpins economic analysis for antitrust and other competition policy, the, the workhorse assumption is um, omniscient consumers, customers, uh, but who are supplied by imperfectly competing firms, maybe a dominant firm, maybe some tight uh, oligopoly. But it seems clear that we have a lot of things going on in the economy and a growing number of competition cases, or with a question mark around that, where the issue is not so much imperfect competition among the firms, but rather um, imperfect information among the consumers. So by competition for imperfect consumers, I mean for imperfectly informed consumers. And there is nothing dumb about being an imperfectly informed consumer. Everybody in this room is that. There are limits on the information that we have, limits on how much time we're going to spend gathering and processing information. So this is a very, very pervasive feature of markets. And the empirical evidence shows with absolute clarity that there are many, uh, especially retail markets, 
where some consumers get much worse deals than others, or put it the other way around, some get much better deals than others, for what looks like essentially the same product or service. So we have a great deal of price um, dispersion. And this can happen even if the market on the supply side is moderately competitive. It's not only in um, monopolized industries that that feature occurs. Industries that look you know, fairly competitive, where there doesn't seem to be grounds for a dominance case, there doesn't seem to be, don't seem to be grounds for anti-competitive agreement cases, and yet you can get this widespread price dispersion. So what I want to do is talk today a little bit about the economics of those situations and raise questions more than answers about appropriate policy responses, whether under the umbrella of competition policy or maybe consumer uh, policy, consumer law even, um, and we can uh, come on to discuss those issues. Let me begin with a, a particular example which I will develop later. Now, Paolo's already mentioned retail electricity market in this country, and I will make a comment on that later. This, um, this chart here is from a 2016 report of the UK's Competition and Markets Authority. That authority came about from a merger of the Office of Fair Trading, which I used to head, and the UK's Competition Commission. So the CMA is now a unified authority. And it did a couple of very big inquiries in the middle of the last decade, including this one into retail energy. And the price information you see here, the solid black line, that's called the standard variable tariff, averaged across the, the big six firms, which had been regional monopolists before liberalization and um, uh, are now in some sort of competition, along with competition against um, what used to be many independent suppliers. So there's a standard variable tariff, the default tariff, if you're a consumer and you don't shop around, that's the deal you get, and that's the deal that most households were on. Mid-decade, which is towards the right end of the uh, chart there, there were much better deals available in the market, which are illustrated here by the little circles and little triangles that look like dots, probably, from where you are sitting. And the green, are from the independents, not the big six, and the, the sort of gray, those are from the big six. So several facts are shown here. First of all, you see how the standard variable tariff had risen a lot over time, even this short span of time. You also see how there's big price dispersion, both as between what the big six are offering and the rivals, but also price dispersion within the offerings of the big six. One of the big six suppliers might offer a one-year deal, very different in, in this period, better terms than the standard variable tariff. So that illustrates the sort of price dispersion, some people getting much better deals than others, and it tells you something about the competitive structure of pricing. And the CMA decided that that was a problem, and they were reviewing this not under Article 101, 102 type law, but under the UK regime for market investigation references, which in a disciplined way allow for uh, remedies to be imposed uh, at the end of the uh, inquiry. And I'll explain what remedies were um, uh, adopted. But I just put that up there as an illustrative example of the kind of phenomenon that, that I'm talking about. So a, a colorful way of talking about these pricing patterns is that there are bargains and ripoffs. That indeed is the title of a paper from the 1970s by, by Salop um, and Stiglitz. And it raises some profound questions. Why is it that some consumers get much better deals than others? Why do some do badly? And I think one is immediately drawn to questions about consumer awareness. Some consumers are aware, perhaps because they take effort, of the different offers in the market. Others don't bother or don't know or don't know that if they search, they might be able to do uh, quite a bit. So we've got different firms charging different prices for sort of the same thing. We've got the same firm charging different prices. And related to this, and there's a growing economics literature on this too, is the issue of add-on pricing. That's where I buy some primary product, <coughs> and then maybe there's some, what looks like a very expensive charge for an add-on. 
maybe the, um, you know, if I get a whiskey in the hotel, in, in out of the fridge in the hotel room, I did not do that. But um, they're, they're often incredibly expensive. Or another example is uh, if I go overdrawn on my bank account, the, there could be some pretty steep charges. So that's an example of add-on pricing, where again, a lot of consumers avoid those traps, inverted commas, others um, knowingly or probably not um, enter into them and face quite hefty additional charges. So there are lots of questions here. One is, will market forces cure the problem? I think there's a good reason to think it might not because the savvy consumers tend to be the ones who do well. They're also, they also tend to be the ones that uh, competitors can easily reach. Whereas the non-savvy or naive consumers who tend to do badly, it's harder to envisage uh, competition reaching them because their limited attention or awareness may well be a reason for why they are not doing so well. So if market forces are not going to solve the problem, what do we do? Maybe we do nothing and say, look, you know, it's just one of those things. Intervention might be counterproductive. And I think there's a, there are some warning bells about intervention. I'm not against it, but I think we've got to be very careful about design of policy. Or do we pursue it with competition law? Could we somehow get a 102 type case out of this? You know, this Paolo's dominant over his captive customers. Could we work a case that way? Um, seems a bit strained to me. Or do we use some other bit of law, some regulatory law, consumer law, or whatever it might be? So with that motivation in mind, I want very briefly um, to do three things today. One is to recap on some of the main points I made in a lecture three years ago now, European Association for Research and Industrial Economics. I managed to be president during the pandemic, so um, I gave a wonderful lecture in virtual Bologna, otherwise known as my office in Oxford. Uh, which appeared, if you want to see um, references and so on, in the journal IJIO 2021. Um, the second thing which I, I touched on in that lecture is a, a line of work with M Mark Armstrong, my long-standing collaborator on questions in this space. And finally, I want to come back to uh, UK retail energy markets. I'm also going to say a word about the Italian one and about um, the Australian state of Victoria. So this is a geographically very, very wide-ranging uh, talk. Before I do any of that, though, and this is developed, the, these examples in that uh, eerie lecture, I want to s make a general point and illustrate it about the role of economics in uh, consumer law and in contract law. So economics is all over um, uh, competition law. Whether the lawyers like it or not, there has been, there's a lot of economics involved. It's grown greatly over the years. It's true, I think, now in all, all jurisdictions. And economic analysis has come to inform legal developments. I mean, ultimately, it's up to the judges, not the, obviously not the economists. But economists are everywhere. If you look, by contrast, in consumer law or contract law, um, it's very hard, especially on this side of the Atlantic, to find uh, economists anywhere. And yet, I want to argue there are some issues of first order economic importance going on in some of these cases. And the two there on the screen uh, are my illustrative examples. These are two cases that went to the UK Supreme Court. First one, 2009, was on unauthorized overdraft charges. So at the time, if you went overdrawn on your bank account beyond the agreed limit, you would pay uh, often really quite high fees, like £25, £30 uh, fee, plus very high interest rates. And the Office of Fair Trading, after my time, took action against that. Starting in my time, uh, but concluded uh, shortly after, the OFT had taken action against late fees on credit card payments. A legal difference there was that if someone was late on a credit card payment, that constituted a breach of contract whereas the unauthorized overdraft case did not. And that legal difference turned out to be really quite uh, important. The question was, did those high charges, could they be assessed for unfairness under the regulations, EU regulations, on unfair terms in consumer contracts? And those EU regulations are in legislation in many member states and in, um, alas, a non-member state, 
called uh, the UK now. But this case was, um, uh, uh, as I say, some years ago. OFT won in the Court of First Instance and the Court of Appeal, but it lost in the uh, Supreme Court because that court took the view that these overdraft charges were part of the price of the current account service. Contingent price, only triggered if I go overdrawn without, uh, beyond my limit. But they said it's part of the price properly conceived. And therefore, because those regulations don't reach, you're not allowed to assess for fairness price, they were um, uh, outside those regulations. Now, the case turned fundamentally, principally on that point. Are these contingent fees, often very opaque at the time, part of the price or not? And that's how the ultimate court came out. Now, the economics of, uh, of this, and I'm not saying economic analysis would have changed the verdict. The economics of this, I think, are really interesting. But it's only in um, comparatively recently that the literature has, partly influenced by behavioral economics, has got back to looking at these questions. And I say got back to because there's an earlier literature going back to the 70s, which I think is very much on point. The second case may well seem trivial uh, by comparison, but I would argue it's not. It was a man called Mr. Beavis. He parked in a car park near, some, uh, near a shopping center, also near a railway station in a town in the UK. There were big orange signs that said, free parking up to two hours, after two hours, 85 pounds is the charge. He stayed nearly three hours. He got charged at 85 pounds. He said, this is outrageous. It's exorbitant. In no way did my staying an extra 50 minutes impose a cost on the uh, parking lot owner, anything like that. It's contrary to an ancient principle of law that you cannot have penalty charges for breach of contract. Uh, a century at least of jurisprudence on that principle, kind of liquidated damages principle. The UK Supreme Court um, clarified that 100 years of law, or to, in, the, in the eyes of some, upended 100 years of law, when it said, even though that charge is well above the cost imposed on the car park operator, it is not to be construed as a penalty because there were perfectly legitimate other reasons for that charge. Um, <coughs> in particular, encouraging consumers who were going to go to the shops rather than consumers who might be about to get on the train to London. So the court said there is a perfectly good business rationale um, that is not punitive, and therefore um, the, uh, Mr. Beavis lost uh, his case. It was a parallel case about an entirely different um, uh, matter which was done in, in conjunction. So this was a big clarification slash change in British English contract law. And I know about it only because I was sitting next to one of my law professor colleagues at lunch, a contract lawyer, who is now on the Supreme Court, as it happens, uh, uh, and we got talking about this case. I think there's lots of fascinating economics in it um, about uh, efficient incentives for breach of contract, about ex-ante investment incentives and about the mix of um, uh, uh, adverse selection issues. And whereas in the US, because of the law school tradition, there are law and economics academics who work in this space. Again, my impression is that on this side of the pond, there are very few that do so. And I think it would be a thoroughly good thing and really interesting if there was more work in this area. So that's my advert for us to get more, us economists to get more involved um, in these things. I've been told that as a rule of thumb, if people in ties are lawyers and people not in ties are uh, e economists, at least among the, the men folk here. So uh, I hope at least there are some economists. Paolo's an uh, exception. He's an exception, but you know, he's, he's uh, Paolo. Now, the literature on this, I won't um, dwell on this. I will just make the point that um, there are papers from the 70s and early 80s Perhaps the best known of these is Hal Varian's um, paper in American Economic Review 1980 called The Model of Sales, uh, which looks at competition between firms when there are some captive customers, the ones who, who don't shop around, they're only aware of one offer, all the people getting the standard variable tariff, you might think, 
And on the other hand, the non-captives who search around, they know, they know the local restaurants in that market, they shop around for a better deal on electricity in the newly liberalized Italian market or whatever. So there is a, um, you know, a long tradition, this is going back almost 50 years, of papers in this area. And what a number of us are working on now, and highly selectively, this is total self-preferencing, bias, favoring, I'm just going to talk about some work that Mark Armstrong and I have been doing in this vein uh, in the last um, 15 years. And our work has had the two aims that you see there. One is to try to generalize beyond the typically symmetric settings that the earlier literature worked with to try and see if more generally we can do some economics about how patterns of consumer awareness um, uh, relate to um, patterns of pricing. That's one aim. That's actually the, the second aim of those stated here. The other is to try and take this literature and its development and apply it in, you know, in simple ways, but to see if we can develop some economic intuitions to questions of the kind which I have been talking about, the limited awareness. So um, here is a, um, a bunch of papers. These are five papers over the last 15 years. The first, um, with Zhidong Zhu, uh, looked at price caps and the relationship between price caps, which are a natural way you might think to protect the uninformed consumers. Ha but, but a price cap could diminish customer engagement with the market, because if there's a cap, there's much less incentive to search around. So the people who are willing to search around might be less bothered to search around if there's a price cap. And the somewhat surprising fact, which an earlier paper had shown as well, is that in a perfectly s regular model, not a freakish model, a price cap can actually increase the average price paid by consumers. Because although it, um, because the downward effect of the cap on prices can be more than outweighed by the effect of the discouragement to search. So it's not a universal finding, but it's saying that by discouraging consumer engagement, a cap can have uh, counterproductive consequences if your aim is um, the uh, benefit of consumers overall. Maybe the cap benefits some consumers more than others, and if you have distributional concerns, then you might be still achieving your objectives. But anyway, that was that paper. The second one there was a paper motivated in discussing the unauthorized overdraft case I mentioned a moment ago. The third paper I will talk about in just a second. The fourth paper was in Econometrica last year. That's a, a kind of general, well, general-ish analysis of how the relationship between patterns of consumer awareness and patterns of pricing um, what, what the relationships are there. I'd love to spend more time on that uh, explaining it today, but I think I, uh, there isn't the time for that. And the final one is work in progress, which I hope, wi which we hope to finish next month, um, but that's um, not yet been issued as a working paper. It looks at the case where the same firm might be supplying two or more versions or brands of the same product or service even though that product or service is fundamentally the same. And maybe it prices them at different levels. In the one case, trying to uh, make money out of the captive customers. In the other case, trying to compete uh, more vigorously for the non-captives. So on this point, discrimination against captive customers, this does appear um, really very uh, prevalent. Um, so there are some examples there. I've mentioned the CMA already and on energy retail markets. They've also looked at loyalty pricing. That's the phenomenon where the people who just roll over their annual contract, whether it's insurance, um, I know, pet insurance or travel insurance or whether it's um, uh, telecom services, mobile contracts, things of that kind. Uh, they typically get worse deals than the switchy people who are um, uh, prepared to scout out alternatives. Now again, is that a problem? And if it is, what do we do about it? Those are the, um, those are the fundamental concerns. And just as price caps discouraging search can be counterproductive, 
there are important papers, I suggest, from the 80s in um, oligopoly theory saying you've got to be careful about banning price discrimination when there is competition between firms because um, the ban on the price discrimination might blunt uh, the competition, which otherwise you would um, want to foster. So, quick word on the, um, the 2019 paper with Mark. That's called um, Discrimination Against Captive Customers. Um, I think for the economists in the room, I might let you just view the upper part of this, this um, slide rather than me going into model details. But the basic story here is that we look at a, um, a duopoly model. Let's say I'm one firm and Paolo is the other. Let's say I'm the larger firm. Let's allow for asymmetry. Um, I've got some captive customers, so does Paolo. I've actually got more than him by virtue of my being the larger firm. And then there's a pool of contested customers kind of in the middle. Now you can compare how competition would operate in this market under a regime where Paolo and I are allowed to do price discrimination. In that case, we'll basically rip off the captive customers that compete very hard for the contested ones versus a regime where we're compelled uh, not to discriminate. Then there will be kind of asymmetric duopoly pricing in um, technical terms, it involves mixed strategies in the kind of model that we are looking at. <coughs> and which, which regime is better for consumers? Well, there's no general truth here. Um, in the model described, Paolo and I do better if we're not allowed to price discriminate. However, when we are allowed, the variation of outcomes is much wider across consumers, some doing very well, some doing very badly. And that variation um, if consumers don't like risk, which is, I think, the normal case, is um, a detriment to be weighed in the scales. So if you start off with us pretty symmetric, close to symmetric, it would serve the consumer interest to ban price discrimination. But if we're sufficiently asymmetric, the opposite is true. That's the basic story. That's just a, almost like a toy model, but I still think it's worth trying to think through these models, and one can develop into much richer information structures, which other economists, I think in particular of um, um, Bergman, Brooks, and Morris, uh, they have been doing in a very rich line of work. So enough on theory. I'm now going to talk a little bit about um, back to retail energy markets, um, beginning in a moment with the, Aus with the Australian uh, case. Make, let me make an observation, though, on, on the um, the Italian case um, involving SEN, part of the NL group, which went to the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, who gave judgment last year. And I, I learned from Paolo this morning that the um, uh, Italian courts have been back uh, on the case. The, the issue in that case had to do with whether there was, um, uh, and Paolo can correct me if I'm wrong, um, privileged access to customer data within the NL group, which um, had the uh, capability of distorting competition contrary to Article 102, or, may, or maybe it's domestic uh, equivalent. So it was an abuse of dominance case about a erstwhile monopolist moving into the liberalized regime. It had customer data um, which was less easily available, the plaintiff said, uh, the uh, Italian authority said. Um, and the fact that the other member of the NL group had access to that data, but the rivals did not, that that was a favoring which um, had the capability to distort competition. Now, my understanding is that on the legal principle, the court in Luxembourg said, yes, that could be an abuse of dominance. But on the facts, it, it turned out not to be sustained. My observation is it's really very much in the landscape I've just been talking about because that customer data and the ability of firms to send marketing messages to customers could very much affect the patterns of consumer awareness. So that struck me as quite a nice example of a more sophisticated and complex case but which um, fits into this imperfect consumer a way of thinking about things really quite well. <coughs> 
So now to Australia. So I want to highlight a paper that appeared last year in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, um, we, which had not been published at the time I gave the, the lecture I mentioned um, at the outset, by David Byrne and colleagues uh, uh, at Melbourne. David's at Melbourne. And it's about a field experiment. So the way it works in Australia, or at least in the state of Victoria, is that the energy suppliers, and I think there are three big suppliers plus uh, smaller rivals, they have their posted prices, but if you're a consumer and you uh, try to negotiate a better deal, sometimes you can do that. I believe that in the UK, you, that would not be the case, that this sort of person-by-person -person negotiation wouldn't be open. But it was open in, in Australia. And the field experiment involved training up actors to call energy suppliers to try and get better deals. And the actors um, had different, were, were uh, portraying consumers with different combinations of characteristics. Um, what posted price they had see, what was the best offer they'd so far received. Um, whether they were in receipt of a subsidy from the government, which was a proxy for household income, a marker of that. And it's really quite a rich field experiment. I'm not uh, aware of, um, well, th there's some in the, in the discrimination, like racial discrimination literature. But in the economic arena, I think this is a very striking and interesting study. And the um, core result you see there quoted at bullet three, which is that incumbent retailers post high prices and are willing to negotiate modest discounts. Entrants post lower prices and are all over the place, heterogeneous, heterogeneous in negotiations, with some of them aggressively discounting. So if you were to plot the, the sort of distribution of prices that firms are willing to negotiate to, the incumbents, those that start off with a lot of captives, have a, a higher distribution of prices than the entrants, those that start off with basically no captives. And this is exactly what comes out of the kind of theory work with Mark that I was talking about earlier. And one reason this is a paper I like a lot is that um, they explicitly say that and they link it to our 2019 paper, which I mentioned. Moreover, because they have a way of getting at income distribution, you know, they find that low-income households tend to be those with um, uh, the most limited engagement with the market, and therefore they get the worst deals. You, you might think that the high-income folk have a greater opportunity cost of time, so they'd be the ones who get ripped off. Uh, on this evidence for that state in Australia, no, it's the other way around. So if, and standard competitional uh, policy certainly doesn't do this, if you want to apply differential weights to the well-being of different consumer types, more weight on the vulnerable consumers, the low income than not, then even if it were net neutral consumers overall, this might be a matter of policy concern to you. Now, from Australia, go all the way um, back to the uh, Northern Hemisphere, and um, let me uh, talk now about the regulation of um, uh, I may have got my slides mixed up just now, apologies, um, regulation of UK retail energy prices. So this has been a long and, in my view, very unhappy tale. Almost 15 years ago, the regulator called Ofgem, so this wasn't competition policy, this was regulatory policy, they banned um, regional price discrimination between um, the erstwhile regional monopolists in the liberalized era. I always thought that was a mistake because it seemed to me that a very good kind of competition would be to have the erstwhile regional monopolists competing with each other. To put, there were six of them, but to put it simply, you know, to have the, the southern former monopolist competing with the eastern, northern, and western, that seemed rather a good idea. And I feared that by banning price discrimination, um, that type of competition would be blunted. And I think there is evidence, and the later Competition and Markets Authority review confirmed that, found um, uh, uh, evidence to that effect. 
and that this ban on price discrimination, though well-intentioned uh, to protect the vulnerable consumers, could well have been against consumer interests um, more broadly. Another intervention by the regulator 2013 under the so-called simpler choice banner was to limit the array of choices that firms could offer consumers. So this was to try and simplify choices, sort of behavioral economics, let's try and um, uh, improve consumer outcomes that way. Again, I think there is some evidence that that may too have been counterproductive. So we come to the investigation of the CMA that took place between 2014 and 16, and the scatter plot I showed you early on in the talk comes from that. So the CMA um, estimated and you may recall that in the mid-teens uh, of this century, the, um, if, you were, if you shopped around, you could get a massively better deal than the standard variable tariff. The CMS, CMA estimated an annual detriment to consumers of 1.4 billion sterling. And they traced it to weak customer engagement with the market. So what do you do about it? Well, measures to promote better consumer engagement. Maybe there are things you can do with apps, smart meters, things of that kind. That had actually been very helpful on the unauthorized overdraft. Text alerts on that bank case turned out to be a very effective remedy. But the CMA thought that's not going to be enough here. We need to have a transitional tariff cap. Transitional until the cavalry, the competition cavalry arrives. How though do you define the, ta uh, the, the cap. And what the majority of the CMA panel recommended, and this remedy was put in place, was a cap for customers on prepayment meters. They tend to be people in rented accommodation, tend to be low income, um, unable to shop around. So it was to protect them. One member of the panel said that's nowhere near comprehensive enough. We need a broad scale cap across the market as a whole. But because he was a minority, the narrower cap was what came into place. Until this became a huge political matter, and going into to our 2017 general election, both parties, even the Conservative Party, were, were favoring legislation to have a much wider cap. So this couldn't be done under competition law, even the type following the investigation of the CMA. It needed legislation, and that happened. And so we had a broad cap. All very well for a year or two. But we then had a wholesale price surge. And this happened months and months before the invasion of Ukraine. So from, from mid-2021, wholesale prices um, rose very, very steeply. And following the Russian invasion, that went even further. So many of the smaller suppliers, because they had not hedged their, their wholesale energy supplies, and because they had thin capital bases in their funding structure, they were quite leveraged. They were doing brilliantly in terms of profits when wholesale prices were low, because they could dive under um, the, uh, what the big six were offering. But when wholesale prices went the other way, they were basically put into insolvency. So there had to be a rescue scheme for the customers of those um, incumbents who leave, le left the market. We had a supplier of last resort regime and associated levy on consumers to bail out the bust firms. Further, in a, year or so, a year ago, because of the even greater elevation of wholesale energy prices, we had an en energy price guarantee put in place by the government at huge cost to the taxpayer. And this capped the bills for everybody, even the well-off. And many economists have questioned the, how well targeted that scheme is. I can well see, given the higher proportion of energy expenditure in the budgets of low-income households, why income support for those households, I can see a very strong public policy case, I really don't see why I should get government support uh, in terms of energy prices, um, even as a result of the events that caused um, energy prices to rise. So what has happened 
is that while we had the era in the teens where the cheapest tariffs were below the standard variable tariffs of the big six, starting in late 2021, that undercutting just left the scene totally and pricing has been governed by caps. The number of competitors has plummeted, so it's gone from um, at its peak over 60, now to under 30 competitors. And switching has greatly reduced, and the switching that does occur now is mostly to the big six, not from the big six. So in competition terms, this has been uh, essentially a disaster. And I think is a case, and we, I, I would say we've, we've seen the same in monetary policy, of um, poor policy, poorly thought out policy, combined with very bad luck. If there hadn't been the bad luck, things probably would have turned out okay. But there was always a significant chance of bad luck, and it has happened um, dramatically. So to wrap up, and uh, as you see, this is more a questions paper than an answer paper, I think this consumer imperfection, entirely, entirely rational, is pervasive in retail markets and is really important. It raises questions that go well beyond the scope of general antitrust and um, merger law. It may take us into competition law, even contract law, which fields economists are not uh, often seen, certainly not uh, in Europe or uh, maybe outside the US. Which policy tools, though, I think is really hard. With enough ingenuity, you might conjure a competition case out of this and say, I'm dominant over my captive customers. I do think that's a bit tortured and strained and might um, dilute or, or, or strain that bit of competition law. Or do you use regulatory uh, remedies? Or do you use um, provisions in consumer law, which, as I've indicated, I think um, economists should learn more about. Whichever tool you deploy, these are all questions about market design. Be very careful about counterproductive effects. They don't always happen, but they can easily happen. And in simple terms, be careful what you wish for. Many thanks. John, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, presentation. And two things came to my mind. Maybe um, all this you are talking about is not even something about economics, but about psychology or sociology. Um, because people tend some. So what does imperfect mean? C couldn't it that sometimes people or, or man simply doesn't want, yeah? W and like, there's a, I see a certain similarity to, um, to like, um, the pe pe there people, there are so many people that uh, gain w wide weight and 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 the government says well this is not good everybody knows it's not good but people still continue um, to to get weight and and this is everybody knows this is insane and but but still we tolerate this so nobody sees a, a need to regulate this and coming back to our issue so W what is the task of the of the lawmaker or the government? Shall he uh, like um, support competition, or shall he prevent misuse of competition? And I think that is a, a very big difference. So, uh, w w I mean, if 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 people say individually uh, balance that they don't care about 
taking care of um, of their the prices for certain products they 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 buy. Is is there an active duty of the lawmaker or the government to uh, to enhance this? Yeah, and and the same is true for for this eternal discussion on. Um, on competition in in banking, so uh, this uh, standard banking, yeah. Why do do people not change their bank in a, in a sense that the 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 European lawmaker wants it? So and he the, the lawmaker says, well, there is some, there must be something wrong that people don't want to to change their bank um, connection over over the time, but like. Stepping back, wh what is the problem? Yeah, if if okay. an individual decides, so um, so yeah. let me um, let me re respond in a couple of ways. The there are many and varied reasons why consumers are less than perfectly informed. Um, I think some are economic. I think many are not. What is clearly true is that the economic effects of this are major and widespread. So I think it's a matter of great economic importance, whatever the, um, the causes are. Uh, in terms of analyzing these issues, I think there are broadly two um, analytical approaches for economists to take, and in my view, they should both be taken. One, which would be under the umbrella of behavioral economics, might look at some of these psychological issues, issues about framing, pro mental processing, biases, though of course who is to judge what is a bias? That's all fine. The approach that Mark and I take, and so do many others, is a, a much more classical approach, which is to have consumers who are, um, in fact, totally rational, but they are just under limited information uh, conditions, or they have search costs for gaining more information. So it's not, in our case, not to depart from optimizing consumers, it's just they've got very constrained optimization um, problem. Now, what, what should the lawmaker do, or the regulator or whoever? I think there are many open questions there, and I hope I was careful to uh, say, you know, do you regard this as a problem or not? And I think there are respectable arguments, and you've illustrated some, uh, for laissez-faire. However, and I can see the reasons, I think many policymakers and legislators and the general public, I mean the political uh, environment surrounding energy prices, and this was in, in the teens, not, not because of the recent wholesale rises, um, was very great. And then I think what, something that economists can contribute to is to try, um, is, is on the design of policy interventions, um, trying to minimize the adverse consequences and go for more targeted things. So I, I'm very much in favor of the text alert kind of in intervention on overdrafts. I think that's targeted at exactly the problem. And if somebody says, I couldn't care less, uh, I'm, I, I don't mind paying the fee, you're, you're kind of guy, I, then fine. But what I like about that is that it's consistent with competition and better informed choice. When, on the other hand, interventions are competition suppressing, such as the price caps, then um, I can certainly see circumstances where that's r the right thing to do. Um, you know, if you've got a great deal of monopoly power, for example, and little prospect of entrance eroding it. But when we're well away from that scenario, I think there can be uh, serious dangers. And the problem with the energy suppliers in the UK, it seemed to me always obvious that the way a number of the smaller firms were making money was that they were doing incredibly well when wholesale prices were low. And clearly, if the opposite happens, they don't, their business model fails. But they were operate, allowed to operate with um, very limited capital buffers in their funding structure. So it didn't take much to, uh, to knock them over. And I think there was inadequate regulatory attention in designing the cap to the capital structures of those firms. Because <coughs> the cont continuity of supply of energy services is obviously cr crucial 
and um, provision had not been made uh, for that um, continuous provision, except through this <coughs> backstop regime where the cost falls on other people. So this mirrors in, in many ways the banking crisis of inadequate uh, capitalization. So that was an example in my view of, of poor uh, market design. So more informed choice, good, um, entirely consistent with libertarian uh, principles as well. And I think there's a big debate about um, uh, how much policy should care about this, these issues. I think my own view is um, uh, it, it should, not, not universally, but I think some of these issues are sufficiently serious that they do warrant policy intervention, but th there's uh, massive dangers of going over the top. So I, I put myself in a sort of middle ground. No, that, yeah, now it works. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's very comforting that you can be a rational consumer and still, you hear? It's too okay, I'm Karl Lundvall from the Swedish uh, Competition Authority. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very comforting that you can be an imperfect consumer and still be rational. And I guess if you're driving around in your car and need to fill up your car with fuel, mm -hmm. then it's also costly to shop around for the best price. And this summer, the CMA had this uh, proposed remedy, an obligation on fuel companies to actually make available their uh, prices at individual fuel stations in order to make app developers uh, give them opportunities to actually develop apps so that you in your car can have mm -hmm. an app that can find the cheapest price for you in a way that is much, uh, which is basically costless. So then I wonder, given your research into consumer imperfection, will such a remedy work? And can you imagine situations or features on markets where such a remedy would not work or perhaps even produce opposite results? Okay, well, I don't, I don't know enough about the factual context to give an opinion on whether it will probably work or not work. I do, however, it, it's an intervention of the kind that uh, I find very attractive because it is dealing with the root problem, which is the information problem. Now, some people may look at the app, some people may not look at the app, but um, that sounds a sensible intervention to me, and if I understand right, there is no, um, no obligation for the same price to exist across all service stations, so it's allowing that variation. The one hesitation your remarks will give me is whether um, collusion between petrol stations might be helped by that that type of transparency. So I think whether whether it works or not, um, I think a factor may be whether the positive, better informed consumer effect uh, is or is not outweighed by any easier collusion effect. Great. Uh, thank you, John. Um, a wonderful presentation. I would like you to say something on the use of your research for a policymaker, which is an intervention that you make from an ex ante perspective. So lots of policy intervention involve winners and losers, and you're trying to make an assessment of, you know, on the balance of probabilities of what's best for society overall or your constituency. So in a, in a sense, it's easy for an economist to find ex post an example of things that went wrong. Okay. Yep. It's easy. But from an ex ante perspective, it may be that it was a perfectly well-informed decision that went fine for X years, and then there was the unintended concept. But unintended looks like you're always saying you shouldn't do that. Because so the message, I, I, I would like to, to clarify, that's not the position of a policymaker to do this ex post assessment. It is informative, of course, to, to revise our, our priors. But how do you use this from an example point of view where you know you are deciding under uncertainty, you know there's going to be winners and losers, and you have to make a decision in the end? Because otherwise it sounds like hands off and see what happens, which is no, a I bit... Uh, you, do, do you get my point, I guess? Yes, I do. I don't... I don't please don't interpret me as a hands-off guy. I, I'm, um, 
the, the meta point is be really careful about policy design. So the UK energy regulators ban on price discrimination. Um, I and others, most notably George Yarrow, who had been a member of the regulatory body, thought was a mistake from day one. And there was um, already economics literature which was consistent with the view uh, that that was an error. So that's not benefit of hindsight. Um, I, I also, I think the nature of the energy price cap in the UK with volatile, it was the combination of volatile wholesale prices and this rather slow uh, revision. It, like I think every six months uh, the, the tariff cap would be revised and that's plenty of time for someone, for an independent supplier to go bust and the lack of attention to capital structure regulation. Now, if there had been capital structure regulation, that would have raised the cost base of these suppliers and there's a trade-off there. But um, I, I, I think, I think there, there should have been. So, um, so again, my point is not don't intervene, it's just think carefully about the, the, the nature of the interventions. My, my feeling for these questions is it's, it's not Article 101, 102 type intervention. I just don't, that doesn't feel right. It's something else regulation. Um, and the design of that can be terrifically important. And one, it's important to learn from these um, mistakes which have happened. I hope that's at least par par partially responsive uh, to myself. Uh, Mohammed from LAIR. <laughs> Thank you very much for your outstanding presentation. So uh, I wanted to ask you one question. Uh, this imperfection in car consumers has created uh, a new market, which is the market for price comparators. Do you think these markets have reduced the cost uh, for these uh, consumers who do not want to shop around and uh, might solve the problem in the long term? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I haven't looked very closely at that question, but it's a nice example of how the, um, the pattern of consumer awareness, which in the simple models is taken as given, um, can be influenced by um, either what participants in the market do, like, you know, advertising by firms, search by consumers, or third parties do. And in this case, it's an intermediary coming in, um, potentially lowering the cost to consumers of wider awareness. Now, I think there can be many, many issues about um, the commissions taken by those platforms, by the um, criteria by which someone's admitted to the platform and so on. So again, there are many market design issues and, and issues that what one from a policy perspective would want at least to be comfortable about, in particular so people are not misled that you know, they might think, ah oh, yes, these are the best offers on the marketplace, and in fact they might not be. So that would be an, an increase in imperfection rather than uh, the opposite. But um, you know, on the whole, I would see that as um, a welcome development, as a tool uh, for greater uh, consumer engagement. But I do think the side issues are ones that need careful attention and thought. Try this one. Okay. Ah. It would be very nice to keep uh, talking with you, John, but unfortunately we have the coffee break. You can continue to talk with, uh, with John and the others on this fascinating topic. Um, I just want to thank you once again for being with us uh, and I think you deserve a final applause from the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you.